So the future of Super Rugby came up again uh, recently. A lot of talk about whether come 2021, when the current broadcast deal ends, whether there's still going to be 15 teams, if a team is going to get the axe, which team it's going to be. Uh, the Sunwolves were the main kind of target of that piece. Um, Sansa have kind of come out and said, you know, they're still working through things. They haven't really made a call on what's going to happen. Uh, but it does bring up the question as to what happens with the South African teams. Because there are, I mean, there's generally seem to be two groups. The ones who are pretty vehement that the, the Bull, Stormers, Sharks and Lions should stay in Super Rugby. That's kind of, you know, where uh, they see better competition or better history or for whatever reasons, they have their own reasons that they'd rather see them stay. And other people kind of say, no, the time zone makes sense. The travel makes more sense that we, we align with. Uh, with Europe and concentrate on getting all our teams into the pro, uh, the pro 14, the pro competition to make it pro however many teams um, going forward. I mean, despite issues with like seasons, it being, you know, summer in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, whereas when it's winter up north, um, there's a lot of other issues to go with it. But I thought for this video, we'll have a focus on the two teams which are already gone uh, their way up north. That's the Cheetahs and the Southern Kings. Uh, just to compare the their, their end of their Super Rugby life and then the start of their, their Pro 14, kind of how has the transition gone in a few areas? Um, some of the stuff's hard to measure because not all the information is available, like how much money are they making, how much money are the players making. This information, as far as I could find, is not publicly available. Uh, part of the reason for wanting to, in those that say South Africa should go north, uh, the salaries of the players is one of the arguments, you know, that if we're in Europe, we're going to be getting paid more money. I'm not sure what those numbers are like, whether the Northern guys, the guys based in like the Cheetahs and Southern who are, Southern Kings who are playing up North are actually getting comparatively more or less to, to the guys who are playing for the other four teams. Uh, but it would be interesting data to get my hands on if I ever could. But yeah, let's have a look at these two teams uh, and see... How does it compare at the end of the Super Rugby time to the start of the, the Pro 14? So I'll start with attendance. Attendance is always a nice one because it's pretty easy to get a feel for how well supported these teams are. And that's been one of the major issues uh, with Super Rugby in the last few years and kind of one of the reasons that they decided that there needed to be fewer teams in the competition. So I'll start with the Cheetahs. Interestingly, they announced their their gates, their attendance numbers uh, for the first three games of their final season uh, in Super Rugby, which was against the Lions, Bulls and Sunwolves. They pulled in 15, 18 and 15 odd thousand people. The average of those three games was 16,431 fans, which in my books is pretty decent numbers for a Super Rugby game. Uh, for some other teams, those would probably be considered a bit low. Like I know the Stormers generally get better numbers than that. Uh, but I think for most of the New Zealand teams, obviously smaller market, but you know, to be getting 16,000 people through the gate would be pretty happy times. But those are only the first three games and it didn't pan out to be the best season for the Cheetahs. So I can only assume that for the rest of the season, those numbers dipped. Because if you look at their uh, 2016 numbers, which I was able to find... Uh, their average attendance was 7,780 over that full 2016 season. So I can't imagine they were getting double that all of a sudden in 2017 with no reason. I would imagine that those numbers of, you know, in the 15 odd thousands probably dipped for the rest of the season. Uh, as again, I don't have the numbers, but it would make kind of sense. Uh, for the Kings, their numbers really fluctuated. I could only find three of their results as well. The first two, and then one against the Sharks, which was not in, in order. It wasn't their third game, but it's the only other game that I could find uh, the number of people who attended for. So the first game against the Jaguars, 2017, the Kings had 2,226 people, which is pretty low. Uh, but the next game against the Stormers, obviously two South African teams up against each other, uh, 9,968, so verging on 10,000, pretty respectable. 
And then the game against the Sharks, a massive 21,000. So the average over those three games, 11,000 people. Uh, but again, I'll look at their 2016 numbers, which were available as probably a better indication of where things were at. Uh, 6,914. So not huge numbers for the Kings, well below 10,000. Uh, you look at the Brumbies, who this year just gone, had kind of dire straits, low attendance for the for the 2018 season, uh, almost begging people to come out uh, for, was it the game against the Sunwolves, after the Rebels? The Rebels game, they only had about 5,000 people, and the chairman or somebody came out and said, if you guys don't come, the club's not going to survive. Uh, they averaged about 8,000 for the season, and that's in Australia, so I would have thought I mean, Canberra's, I don't know what the population of Canberra is, but it's not a huge city. It's not Sydney or Melbourne. Um, I mean, I know Port Elizabeth's not the biggest city in South Africa either, but I would imagine that 7,000 is still pretty low. So, yeah, I'm going to take the 2016 numbers as the main ones going forward. So around about 8,000 and around about 7,000 for the Cheetahs and the Kings, respectively. How does that compare to their Pro, um, Pro 14 campaigns, which which immediately jumped on uh, the the end of 2017 and then continued into 2018 for that first season the cheetahs were down about 1700 to an average of 6050 fans per game uh the kings were down a bit more down to 4335 so yeah not not great numbers but given that it was the first year i kind of don't don't put too much scrutiny on those numbers because the fans have just watched a whole Super Rugby season. They may be feeling a little bit turned off by the fact that their team's been withdrawn from Super Rugby. Uh, some of them are definitely, you know, going to be pretty annoyed and not wanting to come back. But you'd hope second year uh, things are on the improve. Good thing about the Pro 14 is unlike Super Rugby who started fudging, or not fudging, but at least hiding all their numbers... Pro 14 puts their numbers out for every single game. So credit to those guys for actually giving us the information. Uh, the Cheetahs this season, 2018-2019, are uh, averaging 3,945. So their best attendance was just over 5,000. Um, some of the other games, 4,700, 4,400, 3,328, 32. So that's, you know, we're not... We're not at the end of the season yet. That's just up until this point as I make this video, uh, which is at the start of December 2018. So the Kings average is 2,756. Uh, so, you know, highest 5,000 again. You know, 3,100, 2,400, 1,100, 3,200, 1,400. So the attendance numbers aren't great for these two teams so far. And again, there's probably a variety of reasons for this, and I'll touch on some of those in a bit. But just in terms of pure attendance numbers, it's not a great look. Uh, one thing I found interesting is there's been a bit of talk about the times when the games are played, because for the most part, Super Rugby games based in South Africa generally take place in the afternoon or the early evening, whereas the Pro 14 games, a lot of them seem to be a bit later. So, I mean, the gap between New Zealand and South Africa is, or in Europe, to be fair, pretty much same time zone for the most part, is, uh, is usually around about 12 or 13 hours. So if I get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and there's a game on, it's on at 7 at night. Uh, makes sense. Uh, it's easy enough to kind of keep uh, keep track of. And one thing they said that's a factor against South African teams moving to the Pro 14 is the fact that they have to play these games later. And that the teams don't like putting games on late because they get fewer people at the, at the game because there's uh, more risk of getting robbed or something late at night on the way home after a game. So people would rather go to an afternoon game when the sun's up rather than a late game when the sun's down. Uh, that's what I've heard only anecdotally but by a few kind of experts in South Africa. But I had a look at some of the kickoff times. Uh, you know, for their last seasons of Super Rugby, the, the Cheetahs had at least uh, three games, like two of them 7.30, one 7 p.m., uh, one 5.15, and then all the rest kind of afternoon 3.05, 3.05, 2.05. Uh, 
So they seem to be still pretty willing to play games, you know, if you're starting at 7.30, you're not going to be finished until after 9. Uh, the King's a bit a bit earlier, most of their kickoffs are around 5, 5.15, one of them 7.30, one of them 7pm, uh, a couple at 3 o'clock. That was in their last season of Super Rugby. Whereas in the Pro 14, uh, the Cheetahs have had a lot of 7 and 30, 8.30 kickoffs, which is, again, not that different from what they were having in in Super Rugby, but I didn't see the same trend to also have those afternoon games to mix it up. Whereas the Kings had a mix, a good mix of afternoon and evening games. So people in South Africa will have to tell me how much of a factor the time of the game is. I certainly know in New Zealand we only, for the most part, only do evening games. And it does, for me, not as a worried about getting robbed thing, but just, I've got kids who need to be in bed, so... Uh, I'm sure I'm not taking them to a game which kicks off at 7.30 local time. Uh, if it started... If I could get the kids to bed, I can definitely go, but it's a factor for me just as a parent. So, um, yeah, you guys have to tell me how much of a factor that is. So, not sure how much the kickoff time is a factor, but uh, certainly the attendance is a down for, with the move into the Pro 14. Next thing I want to look at is Springbok performances. So, the Kings and the Cheetahs, I don't think, historically have ever been huge, not directly. I know uh, a lot of guys tell me there's a, a heap of Free State guys who end up playing for other teams and then representing the Springboks, but the Cheetahs and the, um, the Kings have never been the main teams to make up the Springboks, but I thought I'd compare their last season of Super Rugby to now. How does the, the split go? So 2017, especially in the Rugby Championship, there were four cheaters in the in the Springbok team. It was Kasim, Mahoje, Rule, and Fenta. There were no Southern Kings in the team at all. Uh, for the June test this year, moving into Pro 14 times, uh, the cheaters had two. Uh, it was Mahoje and uh, Oxenche. They played once against the uh, the Welsh in the US and then no more and there were no Kings in 2018. So in terms of Bok representation since the shift to the Pro 14 there's also been a drop in Springbok caps for guys playing in those two teams. So it seems to be another factor that if you want to represent the box you better either be playing in Super Rugby which is where the majority of the teams uh, the team, the Bok team is, is represented from, or you better be one of those star players from abroad. Because all throughout the Rugby Championship and the November Tour, no Cheetahs or Kings players are uh, considered. So, mm, it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to look at is just the record of the teams, wins, losses and draws. Uh, in the final season of Super Rugby, the Cheetahs had a record of 4 wins, 11 losses, no draws, which was good enough for 13th out of 18 teams, missing the playoffs. The Kings were actually slightly better, 6 wins, 9 losses, good enough for 11th out of 18, also not good enough to, uh, to make the playoffs. Uh, the first season in the Pro 14 went a bit better for the Cheetahs, uh, six, no, sorry, 12 wins, 9 losses which was good for third out of seven in Conference A. They did make the playoffs, but got knocked out in the quarterfinal. The Kings had only the one win and 20 losses, which was good enough for the Wooden Spoon, seventh of seven in Conference B. Uh, this season, thus far, the Cheetahs are at two wins, seven losses, and a draw in sixth out of seven in Conference A. The Kings, one win, nine losses, again in seventh in Conference B. So results, apart from that one first initial season for the Cheetahs, it's not it's not been fantastic uh, thus far. But these teams have both had a lot of changes in players. The, the, the Cheetahs have virtually been stripped of all their big guns. And uh, from what I looked at the Cheetah, the Kings, uh, yeah, massive changes in their lineups as well. So. I'm not quite sure where these teams are at, whether because I haven't seen a whole lot of the Pro 14 in terms of the domestic games. Like I've been watching European Champions Cup, but these teams aren't eligible for that. So for the for the European comps, haven't, I've seen a bit of it, but kind of passing here or there. So you guys will have to let me know how good these teams are. 
I know there have been some close results, but also some blowouts. Um, traditionally, I think the home form should be better. Obviously, uh, you know, when the teams are having to travel down to Africa, you'd hope to get a better result, but it's not always been the case, especially this season. So, yeah, this begs the question for me, if the fans aren't attending as much, still early days, obviously, as people get more into the comp, as people start to know, wow, length is coming to town, this is a big game to go to, or, you know, we, we really need to get this win over Benetton because they're in a similar position to us, or whoever, uh more people will go because you know who the other teams are i know in new zealand if you said you know the warriors are going to play you think it's rugby league there's no nobody in the world is going to think nobody in new zealand is going to think it's glasgow warriors it's just a thing um so yeah the awareness as it raises will likely get more fans to come out but i feel like if all the south african teams go you immediately get buy in not that it's something i want to see happen I want South African rugby to do well, but if the the teams in the Pro 14 are going to get proper, I don't know, respect, or at least fans attending, guys getting chosen for the Springboks, and get better results, I think you need better players playing there. Again, still early days, so I kind of qualify this by saying, you know, it's not, I'm not saying it's the end of the world for these two teams, but... If they're going to add something to the competition, I think there needs to be more. There needs to be better players going. They need to be getting better results. They need more fans attending. Hmm. So if, if all the Springbok teams, Springbok teams, the South African teams go, if it's six teams over in there, they can have their own conference or something. However that works, uh, you get all your best players playing over there. The, the, the matches are really more meaningful. Springbok connect, uh, c contention is to be... You know, considered by the, the guys playing for those teams. I think it can work. How does it work if one team breaks off from Super Rugby? So it's a split of three and three. Still feel like that's going to be edging towards Super Rugby, but I guess all that could change. Um, so yeah, it's been an interesting look. Uh, because, as I said, there's kind of two camps of people and some are saying, let's all go to the north and see what happens. Uh, there are some people who are existing Pro 14 fans who are saying we don't necessarily want all these extra teams coming in. We saw what happened to Super Rugby when it got too big. Other people are saying you guys are sending us your dregs. We don't want the dregs. If you're going to send them, send us your best guys because they want it to be a top level competition. I know there's always a bit of banter between uh, Premiership and Pro 14 fans about which is the better competition. So, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not ideal in its current state, but it is still only the second season. So I'm not sure what the coverage like is over there in South Africa, whether it gets as much media attention as, as the Super Rugby Comp. I wouldn't imagine so from what I'm seeing here. Um, so it's not been a huge step forward, but obviously you'd have to say it's better than not existing. When they were cut from Super Rugby, you, you take this because it was, it was the, the option which kept your team alive. But if these teams are going to take a step forward, there probably does need to be a bit more. Uh, you guys, let me know your thoughts. As I said, uh, not all the numbers were available for the 2017 season for uh, for the Super Rugby side. But yeah, there's just an interesting look at, uh, at how these teams are going and uh, the potential there for them to get better. You guys, let me know how you think they can possibly go. Uh, can they become kind of genuine contenders to be the main teams that the Springboks come out of? Does it need to be a full shift for all the South African teams to go north? Or is it kind of a failed project that they need to, to start pulling back from? Uh, from well, everything we hear about South African rugby at the minute is, is pushing in that direction. So I'll be keen to get your guys' thoughts. But um, yeah, that's it from me and I'll uh, talk to you again soon. See you later.